Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome to the Stanford MBA alumni panel for people who are interested in the broader technology arena. My name is Carrie Oliver, and I'm your host today. And we'll start in a few minutes because it'll take a little while for people to be um, let in from the waiting room. So I uh, want to just welcome you. Um, thank you for being here. That's also to our alumni panelists. And please feel free to open up the Q&A pod and uh, introduce yourself, your name and where you're calling in from today, because it's always fun to see who's with us and uh, we, get to, we get to wave back. My, uh, my name is Carrie Oliver again, and, and I am an MBA admissions officer and I'm also an alumna of the MBA program. And my background ranges from public policy to early stage um, internet and SaaS companies and also have been in ag tech. So you'll see some of those industries represented on our panel today. Um, we're going to be spending the next 45 minutes together and based on some feedback we've had from candidates um, or, or, or guests in the past, uh, we're going to extend that five or 10 minutes. If you need to leave at the 45 minute, um, that's fine. Uh, but if you want to stay a little bit longer, you're welcome to do so also. And that goes for both the panelists and for you because we did originally say this would be a 45 minute session. I'm going to um, have the panelists introduce themselves. And then what I'm going to do is moderate questions from, from you. While we are here today, and I think it's really exciting to have a panel focused solely on the tech arena, uh, broadly speaking, I just wanted to quick, you know, flash up some quick statistics. You know, we have a very broad um, base of students that come from all kinds of different backgrounds and industries, and even within these, the types of jobs um, that people uh, have within the, their organizations, you know, vary by function and, um, and focus area. Um, but uh, no matter what uh, career you choose, either before or after you come to Stanford, we really encourage our students to, uh, to seek out opportunities that play to their personal values and interests. Because when you're doing something you really love, uh, you tend to do it better and have a bigger impact. So let's get on with the panel. Uh, so again, uh, people from four, four uh, five uh, panelists, uh, ranging in their various class years, including two who just graduated. Um, again, pointing out that if you have questions of the panel, please use the Q&A box uh, to ask that panel and do the upvote. But uh, panelists, I'm gonna ask each one of you to offer a very brief uh, background about yourself or an introduction. Like, your name and class year are up here, but maybe, maybe the city you grew up in and your current city, and maybe a wee bit of context around your career path and what you're doing today. And then ask, um, I want you to each answer one question and then we'll move on to audience uh, Q&A. And that is, uh, uh, well, Stanford, we like to um, really help people expand their mindsets and think broadly. So I'd love to know what your favorite academic experience was while you were here on campus. And Tamer, well, why don't we start with you? We'll go um, left to right. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. My name is Tamer Nisbet. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York and stayed in New York for college where I went to Columbia and I majored in comparative literature. So I'm a little bit different than a lot of people who are at business school and maybe did something that's um, a little bit more traditional that you would think of. Um, after college, I first worked at a high school in diversity and inclusion and then made my way to California to work at Google in account strategy and finally ended up where I really loved, which was YouTube. And so I worked in media and entertainment before, um, and my team was the content team, and we wrote YouTube's entire help center. Um, and I knew that I wanted to probably stay in media and entertainment, but I wanted to be on the strategy or finance side. So I considered doing consulting, um, but got my dream job on the content strategy team at Netflix, which is a team that does evaluation and strategic forecasting for what shows should be on the platform. And I just started on Monday. So after this, I'll be going to my third day of work, which I'm really excited about. Um, my favorite academic experience was a class called Formation of New Ventures with Jim Ellis, Scott Brady, and Garth Saloner. They are amazing. Two of them are just wonderful entrepreneurs. And then Garth Saloner is a great professor who studies entrepreneurship. Um, and we read cases about someone who had started their own venture every single class. And then that person would come into class. And so we would get to discuss what we thought they should have done, which is a little bit scary when they're right in front of you. Um, and then they would say exactly what they did and why. Um, and we'd have a Q&A and it was just a class that was full of energy um, and light. And I think it will actually really work well on Zoom too. So it gives me hope for this year's class that's gonna take it um, in coronavirus. Hi everyone, uh, 
Um, thank, thank you all for joining and good morning. Uh, my name is Fabian Schwarzman. I was born in Argentina, but grew up in Israel. Uh, did my undergrad and master's in chemistry. Um, that's my background. Then I went to work at Intel as a process engineer and as a group leader. Uh, then I was lucky enough to be uh, accepted to Stanford. And ever since I've been working at a company called AeroFarms, uh, we're the leader of the vertical farming space. Um, which is enough, some ag tech plus other stuff today. Uh, and I lead our business development and innovation efforts. And I think that the most interesting class for me uh, or the best experience, academic experience that I had um, was probably the, there's a class called the industrialist dilemma uh, that was taught in my year by uh, Rob Siegel and Aaron Levy, the CEO of Box. And that was a really, really cool class because we had like people like the CEO of Ford coming in and the CEO of, uh, you know, like very old and big companies, like Caterpillar, talking to us about how Caterpillar is using autonomous vehicles, for example, or autonomous tractors uh, for, their, um, for their work. And it, it's been re really, really cool to see. You know, not, not only the, the Silicon Valley uh, innovation, but also how the incumbents respond to that. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Nan. Uh, great to, I guess, virtually meet all of you. Um, I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I currently live in San Francisco. Um, I, I went to Harvard undergrad and, and after that, did a, a kind of brief stint in consulting. Um, I sort of quickly learned about myself that I care a lot about the problem space that I'm in. Um, and since then have basically been in and out of climate tech. Um, so I worked at Opower, Nest, um, Uber, specifically working on Uber Pool, more people, fewer cars. Um, and I'm actually at Stripe now uh, working on uh, building a new climate team. So we can talk more about that later, but climate has sort of been the problem space theme um, that I've been passionate about for a long time. I've moved in and out of different um, functional roles in product and business and have sort of gone back and forth between GME, PME stuff for a while. Um, uh, my favorite academic experience, I loved, so I took a class uh, called Managing Growing Enterprises with Joel Peterson. And the whole kind of crux of the class is focusing on challenging interpersonal um, situations. And the, it's like two hours of just tough situations um, that are very EQ focused. And I would, I would say I use the tools that I learned in that class almost weekly, if not more. Um, uh, and it was very, that was a very enlightening and sort of, um, it, was, it was a wonderful class and I think has helped me sort of get into a more of a growth mindset for a lot of the EQE stuff that um, we all inevitably face over our careers and lives. Awesome. I'll go next. Um, so my name is Jason Scott. Um, I'm currently based in New York. I actually moved here in March. Um, so it's been an interesting uh, few months. Um, I started my undergrad at MIT. I was actually pre-med and majored in biological sciences. Um, so things have changed. Um, but I uh, went after college into consulting um, in the life sciences and then uh, made the pivot into entrepreneurship and startups. Um, pretty sporadically right before the GSB working at Homejoy. Um, and then after the GSB kind of stayed in uh, the startup ecosystem, a short stint in venture capital at Highland Capital Partners, um, and then a few hopped around to a few other startups. And now I'm at Google running our startup developer ecosystem for the US, um, which is kind of a the nice Venn diagram of many of my interests and prior experiences. So it's been a great uh, kind of journey um, to get here. In terms of classes, and I'm horrible with favorites, but so I'm probably gonna pick two. Um, I will say that um, one that I use pretty much every day, um, which is interesting and unexpected to me, um, is this class I took called Path to Power. And it's all about actually understanding power dynamics and, and generally leveraging that to accomplish and um, impact. And I think for me, um, the interesting part about that is just how do you understand um, power dynamics in, in the workplace and just generally in life and, and just use that to accomplish goals. And those goals can be um, to have 
um, to accomplish a lot of social good, which is um, personally, which personally resonated with me. Um, but then I will be remiss if I didn't mention interpersonal dynamics, which I'm surprised no one mentioned as well. Um, and um, a fun anecdote, um, my T group, actually, we still meet, I'm um, the group of 12 that you, um, that you go through interpersonal dynamics with, we actually still meet and met on Sunday for three hours, um, still four years out. So um, it's been kind of ongoing, um, an ongoing impact in my life. So that's been great as well. Thank you. Um, hi guys, my name is Cleo. So excited to have you here today. Thank you for giving us part of your day. Um, I grew up in a small town in rural Vermont and I was lucky enough to get sort of just full financial aid um, to Harvard where I studied English literature and then didn't totally know what I was going to do and happened to find my way to uh, Amazon out in Seattle where I currently am. I had a wild ride at Amazon. I was there for five years before business school. The first team I landed on was actually the video games team, uh, which I knew nothing about, but got to sort of live a teen boy's dream life for a couple of years there. Like Comic-Con was a business trip um, and had a lot of fun sort of learning about the e-commerce business. And then I eventually transitioned into uh, the digital advertising business, which at the time was quite new at Amazon. Uh, and the fun thing was at that point, I was focused on health and wellness. Um, so a lot of kind of fun consumer brand, you know, launch strategy, go to market, stuff like that. I then you know, was lucky enough to, to come to the GSB, um, interned at Google last summer, and I'm excited to be joining next week uh, doing global business development. My favorite academic experience at the GSB, oh, I'm, a, I'm with Jason, it's very hard to narrow down favorites. Um, I, I have to say, I think one of the opportunities that I enjoyed the most was actually this option called the 390 Independent Research Project. So um, in case folks aren't aware of this, it's, I think personally, it's like a hidden gem of the GSB. So basically what it is, is if there's, first of all, there's a ton of great classes that you can, you know, sort of meet a wide variety of interests. But if there's something you want to learn about that isn't already a developed course, you basically can make your own. And so what that means is, um, like, I would team up with a classmate so I could have the experience, like, you know, working with a buddy and almost kind of testing, like, a co-founder dynamic. Uh, and then a faculty member, you sort of propose it, a faculty member sponsors it, and then you really are kind of off to the races to learn about whatever sparks your curiosity. So during my time at the GSB, I did a 390 research project on cybersecurity, did one on developer productivity and kind of DevOps, and I did one on psychedelic medicine. So really it's a choose your own adventure, but I appreciated that the GSB was so uh, supportive of intellectual curiosity. You guys make me want to go back to school. <laughs> um, thank you. We actually have some very popular questions online and um, it's going to be hard to select. So I was going to actually try to steer this towards one or two of you, <laughs> but I'm just going to, I'm just going to let this one go. And if two or three of you want to wave your hand or just turn your microphone on. So Will and 13, 14 other people are really wondering whether or not and how the D school impacted um, or supplemented your learning at the GSB. And, and it's also asking if, you know, about extracurricular resources available to GSB students, I, I presume around I'm not sure the context around that one, but the, uh, um, but you know, did you go to the D school and how did it add? And were there other things that really helped you bolster your intended career um, in the short and long term? Who wants to go? Great, Fabian. Okay, so so I I took one. No, actually, I took two or three classes at the D school. Uh, so like some of them were really really good. Uh, like I remember specifically a class called, I think from Play to Innovation, uh, which is kind of like a sort of consulting class. Like we have three cases uh, during the quarter where, where we have to help companies um, with their, with some of their tasks. So, and so each, so we get divided into groups of three or four, and then we have to do something that we'll have some element of play, uh, and we'll have to present some, some options to, to, to the company. So for example, in my, in my year, we had the Stanford uh, blood donation center. I mean, they try to help us, we try to help them uh, increase the, the people who, who donate blood. Uh, and we also had, uh, not Patagonia, the other company. Uh, not Columbia, the, the, the third company. Not, not Columbia, not Patagonia. <laughs> uh, 
uh, coming and like, it, it was really cool. Like the CEO came to the class and we all presented him. And, and it, it's, it seems like, you know, since it's, it, it involves play, it could look a bit silly, but it actually like, there was a lot of thought going into that. There were some really cool uh, projects. That's what I was saying. Go for it, Jason. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say, I also, um, I took uh, the, a class called D Health. And I think in general, the design school, what's awesome about it for me is just really being able to, to dive into a space that you're really, really interested in and passionate in. And really, uh, for me, check the box or uncheck the box of if I really want to pursue this after the GSB. And I think um, going into the GSB, I, most of my career had been in life sciences and health and wellness. Um, and I think for me, um, this class allowed me to really explore the entrepreneurial side of that and, and, and working, you work directly with patients and really understanding your customers and your consumers and, and the folks that you're trying to help. And I think um, for me, it actually allowed me to make some decisions. And I think answering the second part of this question um, around um, extracurriculars um, at the GSB, I think in general for my I, my recommendation, um, and take it with a grain of salt, is um, to try as many things that allow you to either check or, or cross things off of your list that, that you want to really get hands-on experience in the industry or in an entrepreneurial setting or um, something that you're actually trying to um, potentially pursue as a path after the GSB. And I think for me, um, that was the approach I kind of applied throughout most of my classes and extracurricular activities as well. Anybody else want to talk about the D school? Okay. So they, um, another very, very popular question here is from Andrew. Um, and I think I'm going to direct this uh, initially at uh, Jan, um, Nan and Jason, um, because it's, uh, it, you all had a degree of tech experience uh, prior to arriving at Stanford. Do you think it would be hard for a student to pivot to tech without any prior, prior experience? Um, I, I can speak, I can, well, you guys are, or the admissions panel is probably um, also uh, well positioned to, to speak to this a little bit, but I have seen people in my class and I've also hired a number of people that, that have not had traditional tech experience. Um, I think what is really amazing about Stanford in particular, if you want to be in tech and you want to be in the Bay Area, Stanford is an incredible network of people for you to get to know both in your class, but also interclass. Um, I have seen a number of my own classmates do this. And I, again, have hired a number of people who didn't have a traditional tech background. I think that um, Stanford, like it is not a guarantee, but I think it very, it, Stanford in many ways greases the wheels to make that, to make that um, transition a lot more seamless. Yeah, and I would say the only thing to add is I generally advise people to take the, almost think of it as like a step function. And in general, like maybe you don't have the functional expertise, but you have the industry or vertical expertise or maybe vice versa. But um, there's always something that you can add. And it's just about finding out what can you add to those teams? Because similarly, I've hired people who had a variety of experiences, but um, there's always something that they add that's missing from my team um, that's really um, impactful. Would anybody else like to answer that question? I can just say that I got into tech without any background in, in it. So, um, and, and two, two out of the, the reason I called on, on Jason and Nana is that they had other careers before they got in. So I don't think you need to get a GSB MBA to get into tech, but it certainly is a great way to launch. Um, Anonymous has a popular question. Um, and again, it's like, I want to invite all of you guys, if you have an interest in answering this one, why did you decide to go to business school and why Stanford specifically? And there's a sub question, which is how has that helped you in your career? Tamar? Yeah, go for it. And then we'll go with Cleo. Um, I, I love answering this question. So when I was at YouTube, I, I was on the content strategy team and I often worked with the product team and I really wanted to transfer to product. So I applied to an open role there, like a role that I knew incredibly well. And I got an, I got an interview and I made it to the final round. And at the end, I didn't get the job. So, um, you know, proactive me went to my director and I asked like, why didn't I get the job? And she said, you know, we, we really love you. We love working with you, but I just don't know if you can learn the tools required to do this job. 
uh, like you majored in literature, like you've never used Excel before. I just don't know if you can do it. And I just remember feeling so hurt in that room because I was like, I can definitely learn how to use this tool. <laughs> this is a tool that like millions of people use. I, I think I can learn it. Um, and I just never be in a position where someone could assume that I wasn't going to be able to learn something. And when I looked at even this, this woman and all the other people who like were at a high level on the business side of YouTube, they all had MBAs. And so it really inspired me to like buckle down and take the GMAT and apply to get my MBA. Um, and then Stanford specifically, because it was in tech, it was in California. I considered going back to New York where I'm from um, because I'm interested in tech and media broadly, but on the media side, so much more so many more interesting things I think are happening in Los Angeles, where I currently am, and in San Francisco than in New York, which is more innovating on older companies. So I really wanted to be in California. Um, and then how did it help post MBA? I think Stanford has been a huge help to me so far. So I mentioned that I was on a team that did a lot of writing and I also worked on influencer monetization and like a little bit of partnerships before. And the team I'm currently on is the finance team at Netflix. So I'm literally like actually in Excel doing something that someone told me that she didn't think I could do um, on a daily basis, valuing content. And that's not a job that I think I could have transitioned to actually without an MBA at all. So going from a content team to a finance team is something that was really important to me and that was really helped by the MBA. Um, and then going to Netflix specifically, I think was really helpful to go to Stanford where there are lots of connections to Netflix already. Thank you, Tamer. Um, so I, I also love this question. It's one of my favorites that we that we get in these types of settings. So, um, so I'd been in the tech industry for about five years when I was sort of kind of at this tipping point of, okay, I've always known in the back of my mind that I wanted to get an MBA. I've sort of had this dream, but um, you know, maybe some folks on the call might be struggling with. It's hard to know. It, it's hard to know sort of when to like take that pause and be like, okay, I'm going to step away from the workforce for two years. You know, I, I really do empathize if folks are thinking, oh, well, you know, the missed salary, this promotion, you know, it's, it's, it can be a very challenging decision. Um, however, the thing that sort of finally made it very, um, the thing that made it easy for me, I should say, to say yes to the MBA was when I take a step back and think about sort of the overall arc of my career, most of us are probably working for about 40 years, give or take, right? Like if you start working roughly around age 22 and you, you know, more or less work till let's say like age 62, four decades is a very long time. And when I sort of take this like macro level of view, I thought, well, if I take two years, especially in that first like decade or so of my career, two years, you know, sort of step off that, you know, treadmill that is, you know, full-time work, fast paced, whatever. And if I deeply invest in myself and learn as much as I can and meet as many good people as possible and travel as much as I can and sort of really, really kind of like deeply invest in broadening my horizons and sort of exposing myself to different opportunities, who knows what the balance of that trajectory will look like, right? And so as I sort of took that macro level view, it suddenly it's like, oh, if I take two years in that first quarter, let's call it, who knows what the trajectory and what the shape of the rest of that time looks like, but that feels like an investment very much worth making. Um, and as far as why Stanford, honestly, GSP was my dream. I didn't, I, you know, I'm being super candid here. I didn't think I was going to get it. I didn't get into Stanford undergrad. And I remember thinking like, what if Stanford doesn't like me? Um, but it's, it, there was just so much about the program that was really important to me. So the fact that there was such a big emphasis on EQ, right? You know, the other panelists have mentioned uh, classes like touchy feely or interpersonal dynamics. Um, we also have a culture uh, or a tradition, I should say, um, called talk, which is basically once a week, classmates share their personal stories and kind of like a long form, almost like 30 minute, very, um, very sort of like deeply personal storytelling. You know, even small things like AMAs, Ask Me Anything, like you'll do that on, you know, bus rides while you're going to and from various places. And I think there's something very powerful about the authenticity and vulnerability of the GSB community. And it's, it's sort of like, I imagine many business schools could kind of give you the hard skills and teach you a different flavor of leadership. But at least for me personally, if I was going to be any kind of leader, I wanted to be a leader in the GSB way, which is sort of that balance of warmth and competence. Um, and I think in a way that's just very, uh, very human. Um, and so as far as fit goes, I mean, that, that was kind of like the, the sort of spiritual alignment tactically. I mean, just as Tamer said, get it. I mean, if, if, if you're on this call, you're interested in tech, there's no better place in the world than Silicon Valley. I mean, the, the sheer richness of opportunities, and I say this as someone who'd like worked in Seattle at a big tech company, it's a whole other ball game uh, here in the Valley. And it's, it's a privilege to be right at Stanford where everything is in your backyard. I mean, I literally went on a tech trek to like Apple Park once, which is usually like pretty hard to get to. Um, and visiting startups and, you know, 
VCs, there's just so much, there's so many opportunities during the two years that you're a student to really explore the field in a very hands-on way that you might, might be challenging elsewhere. Um, and to the last part of the question, I'm like, how did it help post MBA? Uh, each thing that I'm involved in right now is thanks to Stanford, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm about to start a job at Google. I had 16 different GSB alums help me on my path as in interview prep, informational networking, preparing for the internship interviews, navigating Google once I got there, helping me negotiate my return offer. 16 different alums helped me on the Google front alone. The other sort of two buckets of things that I'm involved in right now, um, one of them is actually entrepreneurship. So um, over the last couple of months, a Stanford professor and I have been working on a startup idea, which is something we're sort of continue to be doing um, as a fun and interesting side hustle in the, in the months to come. And then the last chunk is actually around angel investing. So I know nothing about angel investing or I didn't until recently, but because of some of the work I'd done at Stanford, um, I was able to, to get involved um, and make my first angel investment recently. So across sort of like the Google piece, the entrepreneurship piece, and now angel investing, like doors are opening to me that never would have opened if it wasn't for Stanford. Jason, did you want to answer that question? I saw at one point you had your microphone off. You don't have to answer it. N not much to add. I would just echo that the, the proximity is um, incredibly powerful. And I think um, whether it be just an investor or a startup just coming to campus for lunch, um, it's, it's, it, um, it's, you just have so much access to the tech community there that I think um, is, is invaluable in many ways. So I, not, not much to add, I'll just echo. So another popular question here is really around leadership, um, leadership skills. And uh, uh, I'd love to have maybe, we'll start with Nan and uh, Fabian, because we haven't heard from you just in the last couple, but also invite anybody else to answer this question uh, that how, is, how does Stanford influence uh, your leadership skills? It's in the workplace, but I would just invite you to, to, to see if it goes beyond the workplace also. Oh, okay. I can go first. Um, so I think for me, one of the more influential classes when it comes to leadership was actually touchy feely, um, because or what we call or interpersonal dynamics. Because it's a class. It's like when you hear uh, alums and people who took the class talk about it, it sounds really weird. Uh, it's basically twelve people sitting in a sitting in a room without any subject, without any topic to discuss. Um, but eventually, like you get a ton of learnings of that, and specifically how your actions impact others. Um, and while some some of that is also like is also you you also get to experience in in leadership in lead labs. I think that for me at least, uh, the touchy feely aspect and taking a full class and learning more about how what I say impacts other people really, really helped me hone my leadership skills. Uh, obviously classes uh, like were mentioned before, like MG, managing growing enterprises, uh, leadership perspective, all those really, really help as well. Just, you know, hearing how other people are dealing with uh, tough situations uh, and you know even eventually even like things like view from the top when you hear like really really top executives coming and speaking pretty frankly about uh, some of their current challenges or previous challenges uh, I think that that all really really helped me uh, hone my my leadership skills. Yeah, I think um, I think if you think you're going to graduate from the GSB as like a fully formed, ready to go leader, that's definitely a misnomer. Um, I think for me personally, what I found really valuable is sort of two things. One was seeing a lot of different examples of what leadership looks like. And there are so many different examples and there are so many different leadership styles and there is not right, one right leadership style for even a given person. I mean, the, the way that you lead, I think does shift in context. It shifts over your career. It shifts, it's sort of a function of a lot of different things. Um, I, I personally thought that exposure to all of those different styles was, uh, it sort of opened up my aperture for what it can look like. And then it sort of leaves you this question of, you know, what are the, what feels authentic to you? And I think that part of, that part of the journey is something that you, 
you obviously probably have already started, but like you start and, and make progress in that part of the journey at the GSB. But uh, it sort of takes your whole, I mean, it takes your whole career to figure out exactly what kind of leader you want to be, what kind of leader you are and sort of build and, and, and um, kind of evolve your style and those skills. Um, but I think that, you know, if the GSB places a big emphasis on authenticity and trying to figure out kind of what, what feels authentic to you and um, ultimately gives you a good sort of, ex again, exposure to, to different examples of what leadership can look like and you can take those in and, and work with those for the rest of your career. Amor, Jason, or Cleo, anything you wanted to add? I would, I would also add that I think Stanford does a really good job of empowering women to look at what different types of leadership looks like. Um, one class that I can think of is, uh, there's a class from Fern Mandelbaum, who's a wonderful professor who works at um, the Emerson Collective, and it's about women in entrepreneurship. And there's another class from Laura Ariaga and Dreesen, which is called like Women in Power or something similar to that, which I was a course assistant for. Um, and I, and in, in normal classes, I think professors actually try to do a really good job at showing diverse leadership and making sure that we have international CEOs who are coming, making sure that we have CEOs of color, making sure that we have CEOs from the LGBTQ community. And I think that's really powerful. And I also really appreciated the classes that were really specific to women. Um, and ha then having people like Cheryl Sandberg come to class and like have that be normal um, or Priscilla Chan and being able to ask them questions about what their leadership looks like and to really just see um, myself represented and some of the people who came to class, which I wasn't sure would actually happen when I came to Stanford. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised and really proud of the institution for all of the efforts that they put there because um, it's been intentional. And I think that that's really important to know as well. Yeah, and one thing I would add um, that I hadn't heard already is that um, also at Stanford, you just get an opportunity to lead on campus, right, or just your classmates. And I think um, if you think about it, all of these are future leaders of organizations, startups, corporate enterprises, and by practicing leading amongst your peers, I think you, you, get, you gain a lot of useful skills that you might not realize then, even if it's just planning um, a get together or a dinner or those sorts of things, you learn how to manage managers and learn how to lead leaders. And I think that's really um, been something that I've carried with me as well. Thank you guys. There's a um, couple of questions that are sort of centered around career management and some things we've already touched on, like if, if somebody doesn't have a tech background, what might they want to think about when they're at the school? But have any of you used the um, Career Management Center or know people who did? And if not, then what other um, choices do you have for informal um, job searches or more directed job searches? And I don't know how you guys found your jobs. So you're going to have to raise your hand. Thanks, <laughs> Tamer. Um, I can, I can just stop at this and go first. So depending on what type of tech role that you would like to have, uh, you're more or less likely to get that job through the Career Management Center. And so what I mean by that is like for big tech um, and like just larger startup companies in general, you're, you can find those at the Career Management Center. So any of like the FANG companies are going to recruit on campus. Um, some of like the bigger media tech companies will also come recruit on campus. And also there's, uh, I think there's like one or two days where uh, startups actually come to campus and you can go to the CMC and there's like a fair type of a thing and you can meet a bunch of different startups. So that's only though the companies that have a relationship with Stanford. So if you're interested in doing something um, with a company that's like totally new or with people who went to, who didn't go to Stanford, so maybe there's not that um, relationship with the Career Management Center, then you do have to go out of your way a little bit. Um, but the one is that the Career Management Center can help you, can help put you in contact with alumni. So if you do find an alum at a company that you want to work with, really easy to reach out through the Career Management Center or through um, some of the directories that we have at Stanford. The other thing is the stanford.edu email is quite powerful. Like, um, although I got my job through the Career Management Center, I 
similarly to Cleo did a 390 and I was reaching out to people like very cold either on LinkedIn or um, because I had their email somehow and I, I probably got like an 80% hit rate with responses and so just know that if you if you do want to do something that's a little bit um, out of the ordinary like your chances of actually talking to someone who's doing what you're doing are quite high uh, and the last thing that I'll say about that is a, one way that I know a lot of people got their jobs was actually by doing a project in class about that job and reaching out to a person and saying, hey, like I've been working on this problem, look at this research I've done, and you've done it for class anyway, and then you can show the person that you're reaching out to what you've done with your stanford.edu email. And so kind of thinking of the best ways to cold email people has really worked, um, I think, for a lot of people I know, and they were able to get the startup jobs that they really wanted. Leo and then um, Fabian. Perfect. Yeah, completely. Uh, really want to underscore Timur's point. So I think there's this tendency in business school to sometimes think of things in buckets. Like, well, this is my career time. This is my kid in my time. This is my social time. You can you can multitask. Like I, as much as possible, tried to do what Timur said, which is use your academic experiences as a way to professionally network. So there's a popular class at school called Managing Growing Sales Teams. And the main project for the class is you pick a company and you learn about their sales team. My background's in sales and I was like, I want to pick a company where I might want to work one day and use this as a chance to sort of network within that business, do a research paper, circle back with a map and provide that research. Um, I happened to choose the company Airtable. They're up in San Francisco. And so my whole project team and I got to like drive up to the city for a day and spend a day with three or four different folks at Airtable, which is a pretty you know powerful opportunity. I think there's also just a different, the context feels different when you're reaching out, I think, for an academic purpose versus a job, right? Like formal recruiting is very structured and sort of like the walls are up and it's very, you know, evaluative. I think there's something very powerful when it's more curiosity driven. So again, on the point on 390s, like, you know, I think I probably talked to like eight or nine cybersecurity companies, maybe a dozen or so DevOps ones, 15 or 20 on the psychedelic side. And I have, I sort of, I'm of the mind that if you do enough outbound, you will eventually get some inbound, right? So if you talk to enough interesting companies that are in the fields you're curious about, you eventually will get sort of pieces back. And the last thing that I'll say, just to sort of add one other, you know, hopefully maybe different flavor to this is whatever research you're doing, if you're able to actually take that content and publish it like on Medium or GSB as a student publication called Non-Disclosure, anything you can kind of do to sort of share with the world what you're doing raises your kind of visibility in that field. So to Jason's point around the class path to power, very powerful um, sort of like almost like roadmap to how can you become known in a space, right? Because it's one thing to be applying for existing jobs and we're, you know, we all got to do that. But in the ideal state, jobs are coming to you, right? And so the way that that happens is I think by having a sort of network in the spaces you're curious about, but also having established yourself to whatever you extent that you can as a thought leader in the fields that are interesting to you. That's just what I would add on there. Yeah, and I just, just want to say that in addition to the academic experience that includes classes like now, I think in my, my year was the first time that we had a project, a product management class. So I mean, so, the, so there are some academic work that can be done. Uh, but in addition to that, like, you know, like you have classmates that has been in all over the place. They've been in, in, this, in all, probably in all possible industries, all possible roles. So you'll definitely, if you want to, if you want to, switch to a specific role at a specific company, you might have someone that you can talk to and learn more. And then maybe that person can also connect you to the right people at that company. Um, so I just want to acknowledge just quickly um, the time is uh, if you originally scheduled to um, uh, finish this call at, uh, at the 45, um, please feel free to stay on for the next couple of minutes. I'm going to stay on and hopefully um, one or more of our panelists can stay on for an extra five to 10 minutes after that, and we'll end closer to, um, great, well, closer to, um, uh, well, our morning, 8.55. So um, if you are gonna sign up, um, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you heard some things that helps you know a little bit more about our program. Um, and uh, we have a lot of other events uh, that are taking place over the summer, and you can take a look at our events page on the website and see which ones interest you, including small group chats with a student or an alum or an admissions officer. Or uh, I saw that there was a popular question here about admissions overall. And I would actually bring those questions to one of our information sessions with an admissions officer who's going to be better equipped to answer those questions. Um, so I actually want to just, uh, Nan, I don't want to cold call you, but I think what's really intrigued me about your background is that your, your passion is around climate and you happen to find that home in tech. 
Was there any particular reason that you, you chose that avenue and, and how did you get there? Um, so I was, I mean, I'm trying to remember exactly how I was thinking about this, like uh, after consulting many years ago, but basically I was trying to, I always tried to lay out after consulting what I thought I wanted to solve for. And one of those things was a space that, you know, I, I call it my 2 a.m. test. Will I be excited to work on this until 2 a.m.? And for me, that, that climate falls into that bucket. The second thing was um, I wanted to work at a fast growing company with other really smart people. And there are definitely tons of opportunities to do that outside of tech, but tech is one of the places to find that. Um, and there happened to be at the time, like two VC backed clean tech companies, which were basically Opower and Nest. Um, I applied to Opower and was fortunate enough to, to get a job there. Um, so it was sort of the intersection of, yeah, it was the intersection of the problem space, but also wanting that fast, fast growth environment and, um, and great people. Climate is a weird one. And I don't want to rat hole on this because it's probably won't be interesting to everybody, but I think that like climate, there are opportunities for, for, for climate and tech to overlap. There are more opportunities where they don't overlap, in my view. And I am at Stripe for a very specific thesis around making a market for carbon removal in the absence of policy, which I definitely won't go into now. Um, but I think that um, I, I think there's like sort of a slim overlap in that Venn diagram. And if you can find it, great. But then you have, if you can't, you have to make a decision of which do I care about more? Do I care more about tech or do I care more about? the problem space. I haven't had to make that trade-off quite yet, but I imagine that I will in the next 10 years. Thank you. There's a couple of questions that I think are probably best directed to um, Fabian and Jason, but I'm not, I'm not sure, um, which is engineers can often um, view MBAs with skepticism in the workplace. Um, have, how have you dealt with that or have you had to dealt with that, deal with that and how would you mitigate it? I'm happy to go first, I guess. Um, so yes, I will say there are a lot of people um, also on the engineering and tech side who I think question um, or questioned me when I, when, um, I was deciding to go to GSP. But I think um, ultimately it goes down to just knowing why you're going to business school. And I think you should know this in your application anyway. And, and, and someone has already asked this, like, why are you going to the GSP? Why are you interested in where you're looking to get out of it? And if you feel confident in that and you feel confident that you're actually going to either acquire a new skill, explore a new vertical, explore a new space, meet a great network, et cetera, if you have actual goals for that time, then I think it um, leaves you a little bit more confident that, um, that you're, you're going there for the right reason and that you're going to get the value that you need out of it. So I don't worry about it personally, but I, I yes, of course, um, there will always be for any decision you make, um, people who ask you why you made that decision. Yeah, uh, for me, I would say exactly the same. Like I, I, I had a technical, sort of a technical role before business school. And so for many of the people that work with me or people that, uh, what I, that I reported to or they reported to me, like there was, like I, I got this question, like why, like, you know, like if you're good in the technical side, why do you want to go and do business? And especially, coming from a country like Israel where the MBA is not considered that great because it's very easy to get one. Um, so, but I, I knew internally like what, what I believe in, why, why I want to do that. And that's, that's basically what made me continue. And that was the answer I gave everyone. Anybody else like to answer that? You know, um, I, I'm going to actually ask a question that's kind of hinted in a lot of these things, but we haven't really um, quite touched on it, which is extracurricular activities, um, whether they're related to your current career or not. Um, what is What would be your favorite or favorites, Jason and Cleo, um, extracurricular activities uh, when you are a student or maybe even as, as an alum? And I'm going to open that one up to whoever waves their hand or takes their microphone off. Go for it, Cleo. <laughs> Happy to speak to this one. And conveniently, I think this hopefully addresses another question I saw in the chat, which is just around sort of like the global experience requirement, which I know we haven't really touched on. Um, 
I feel like I majored in organized academic travel at DSP. So as folks were probably you know, possibly aware, um, at some point in the two-year experience, you have to do at least one, it's called a global experience requirement. So this can be a week-long like global study trip during the school year. It can be a global seminar, which happens um, basically the week before you begin your first year of school. It can be a month-long you know, GMIX, which is basically like an internship that's typically hosted in a particular country working at one business for four weeks. Um, and you know, so you have to do just one of those. I wound up doing three because there's just so many interesting opportunities. Um, so for example, uh, one of my favorite experiences of, of the whole two year experience was actually this week before school started. Um, I did a seminar, it's called a global seminar about the ethics of tax avoidance. And it was in Switzerland and the Netherlands. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what's this is school? Turns out it was, you know, it was academic. It was taught by two tax professors who were wonderful, um, but essentially looked at this question of like, how can governments use tax policy um, as a way to sort of tip the, tip the scales in their favor economically. Um, I'm also curious about education. I had been in the joint degree program with the ed school um, when I started at, at Stanford and there was another educational focused trip that was basically looking at Singapore and Malaysia and how education specifically was a major factor in kind of the divergent outcomes of those two countries. So got to go in country in both places and learn about that um, actually from their, from their Ministry of Education, which is quite powerful. Um, and then last but not least, you know, curious about entrepreneurship and got to spend a week or so in Cuba learning about how entrepreneurship looks against the backdrop of, you know, sort of a, a, a communist country, which is really sort of interesting transition point um, in, in the country's growth. So all this to say, if you're looking for sort of academically rigorous and just very, um, I'd say like intellectually enriching travel, purposeful travel, I would call it, there are myriad opportunities. Um, and that was a big area where I focus a lot of my time and energy at school. Um. Tamer or Jason, did you, were, you guys were really involved with talk. Was that one of your favorites or were there, was there an affinity club or industry club that really stood out to you? I will, um, I'm happy to go first. Um, I will say for me, I probably admittedly um, did too many extracurricular activities. I think <laughs> that one thing I will flag is that there are so many opportunities at GSC, whether you are planning um, and participating in their global experiences or running talk or running, um, we used to have a, a GSB production called the GSB show. And um, there's also student government and there's all these other clubs you can be head of, venture capital club, et cetera. So I think um, one thing that I probably, if I had to go back and do it differently, would be maybe um, prioritizing a little bit better because I tend to want to do everything. Um, but I will say at the end of the day, it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, that it was a great opportunity to really learn how to lead and manage your peers and like organize your peers. And I think that does directly translate to um, as you are working with these same types of people in the workplace. So um, I will say all, all of it wasn't for nothing, but I definitely probably did my balance and my scale was probably a little bit too much in the extracurricular activity um, side of things. Um, yeah, I think I was probably similar to Jason in that I did quite a bit and could have better prioritized. But also, I think I learned so much from that. So, in addition to some of the Stanford extracurriculars, like I was a talk coach, so I went to every talk and helped some people write their talks, um, and an Arbuckle leadership fellow. So, as a second year, I helped lead first years through a bunch of different like leadership programs. Um, I also did some things off campus. So, Leo spoke to the 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 amazingness basically of living in Silicon Valley. Um, I actually uh, interned at a VC firm and at a startup separately um, at two different times my second year. And that was amazing because I really wanted to see what it was like to work at a startup because um, I went to Stanford and I was like, okay, maybe I want to do this. And it was wild and crazy and I loved it. And I needed to come back to Netflix, which was exciting, but definitely working at startups is something that I feel more confident about doing in the future because of that experience. Um, and I wanted to learn about venture capital. And so I became a venture capital fellow at Pair VC, which is a 10 minute bike ride from campus and got to actually go to the office all the time and meet founders there and listen to pitches. And so it was really such a good experience. And I think what's really nice about Stanford is you are right in the valley. Like you're, you can walk easily to a lot of the places um, that you might want to intern at. And so it's really nice to take advantage of that, but you might sleep a little bit less than you want to. Thank you guys. Um, so we are now pushing up against the um, end of our session. So I wanted to um, just quickly um, showcase the cornerstone of the Knight Management Center. 
uh, which um, dedicated to the things that haven't happened yet and the people who are about to dream them up. And you probably got a sense that all five of our panelists are dreamers and really bring their values and their passions to not just their education, but their work. It's very intentional. I heard that word multiple times today. Um, so hope that some of you also are, uh, are dreamers and uh, perhaps you're interested in learning more about, uh, about Stanford. And so we do have a lot of other ways to connect with us over the next couple of months. And um, so uh, rather than read this, if you wanna take a screenshot or just visit our website, there's lots of events. We are not on campus right now, but we are answering phones and email also. And just um, change lives, change organizations and change the world. Uh, we've got, we got um, five alums here who are on that mission. And I also just really want to thank you. Um, I know Nan dropped off, but Jason, Cleo, Fabian, and Tamer for being here today. And also just thank everybody in the audience for taking the time to, to learn a little bit more about us. And I hope you all have a great rest of the morning, afternoon, or evening. Music